Hello, welcome to another episode of The Delicious Legacy and our archaeogastronomical adventure. I hope you're all well, healthy and ready to welcome the glorious spring. On this episode, I have a very special guest with me. Her name is Geraldine Morrison and she's an archaeologist, potter, cook, who specializes in Minoan Crete. I'm really excited to have her today. She's going to explain to us about the food of, um, of ancient, really ancient Crete. Uh, we're talking about three to 4,000 years ago. And all the exciting findings that um, she and her colleagues have found the past um, three decades all over the legendary island of King Minos. Yep, Crete is an island full of myths and legends. So, yeah, I'm, as I said, I'm really excited to share her knowledge uh, with, with you on this episode. Um, for those of you that need a sense of uh, location and background, Crete is the biggest um, island on the Greek geographical area. It's uh, full of um, high mountains, uh, rocky beaches, gorges, forests, dry, semi-arid plains. Uh, it has everything, basically. It's um, in the middle of the Eastern Mediterranean, geographically perfectly located between Europe, Asia and Africa. So all the links played uh, a very important role in ancient times for, uh, for the inhabitants to be traders, merchants, naval experts. Crete is very famous for King Minos, King Minos, and from, wh- from whom this civilization took its name, Minoan civilization. And also, it's famous about the myth of uh, the labyrinth and uh, Minotaur. And here is where we find the first uh, civilization as such in Europe, in European uh, soil. And, um, and here we find the first written language that's been deciphered from Europe as well, Linear B. So this, together with the archaeological evidence, gives us a, a tantalizing view on the uh, Minoans' uh, table and kitchen and on the life of the ancient palaces. And so without further ado, let's uh, go to our interview with Geraldine Morrison. Welcome to the Delicious Legacy. Yes, thank you. It's nice to nice to be here. Fantastic to have you on our podcast. And um, yeah, uh, if you would like to tell us um, a few things about yourself and um, yeah, what do you do? Uh, what's your name? Where are you based? And so on. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, it's a good place to start. So my name's Geraldine Elizabeth Morrison, um, but I am from the United States, and um, I was one of those American kids that kind of grew up in various parts in the United States, but I come from Southern heritage. So I'm very used to being in the kitchen, being around food. We had a big garden growing up. So we grew most of our food that we would can and uh, freeze for the winter. And um, so, yeah, so I've always been, been involved with food at some level. Yeah. And um, I am actually based in Greece and on the Island of Crete. And I've been here in some form or fashion since 1997, so a very long time. Oh, wow, okay. So you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I came in my early 20s, and um, since then I've been coming back at least once a year, and then slowly it, it, I ended up becoming a resident. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so what I, what I primarily do is, I guess nowadays the hat that I'm wearing is I'm a culinary archaeologist, And basically what that means um, is that I study food and cooking and eating practices. And I really uh, focus on the Aegean and in particular the Minoan world, uh, sometimes the ancient uh, or classical Greek world. It just Mm -hmm. kind of depends on what project I'm focusing on at the time. But basically the ancient Aegean. And um, for the past 20 years, I've kind of... uh, let's say, merged several different skills. My yeah. my first degree was in fine arts and ceramic arts, so I learned how to make pottery, and mm-hmm. that's how I got into archaeology, really. 
um, a friend of mine, Jennifer Moody, brought me to Crete in 1997 to work on Minoan pottery with her. And then that's kind of how I ended up becoming interested in looking at um, material objects from the past. And then much later in around, I don't know, when was it? I think 2006, 2007, I had a Fulbright to work on a PhD proposal about ancient cooking. And um. so I wanted to create Minoan cooking pots and use the same kind of foods that they had back then to kind of recreate the experience to better describe it, to better understand it, kind of create a living museum. Yeah. Um, to, to, to talk about cooking in a real way and talk about food in a real way rather than just kind of writing about it. And um, that's kind of what I've been doing since then. So I think we're coming up on 10 years, uh, well, a little over 10 years of doing the Minoan Taste Project. And so it's, um, it's taken a lot of different let's say avenues and morphed into different things. But for the most part, that's, that's kind of what I do in all sorts of shapes and forms. This is fantastic. If I knew I was <laughs> yeah. going to be so interested in ancient food, I would have chosen this career path 20 years ago. Well, I didn't know I was doing that. I think that's the kind of the funniest thing is like, you know, you just kind of maybe you have this experience as well where you just kind of open the door of curiosity and then the next door of curiosity is opened and the next door and the next door and you just kind of walk on through. Yeah. And um, <laughs> and that's just kind of the way it ends up working out for the for for me right now. Mm. And, I, and it has been like that. So... I don't Fantastic. think that's going to change. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about in Crete? Are you based at the moment? Um, I'm kind of, <laughs> well, I'm very pan Cretan. Um, I am, my primary work is in Lasithi yeah. on the east side. I work at um, a site called Makalas Excavations and Popa de Ocobos Excavations. Um, and I also am living and working in Hanya. Okay. So I, I go back and forth between the east and the west coast. Mm -hmm. and um, But for a very long time, I have been primarily in Arapatra. But um, the this year with um, the 2020 year of all years, I think everyone has experienced quite a lot of different shifts. Yeah. And so I had decided to refocus a little bit on the island and go back home to Hanya. Um, even though I still spend a considerable amount of time in Lasithi and still have a home base in the Rapatra area. And so right now I'm doing both just yeah. to kind of refocus and recenter my work and, and kind of think about what I'm doing. And so that's been really nice to do, actually. Is there a specific site that you're working on at the moment, something specific that um, you are involved with? Yeah, there's um, there's two fabulous projects here in East Crete. We have really amazing uh, preservation because it's a lot more arid than the rest of the island. Mm -hmm. I don't know if many people know about the island, but it's basically, you could drive across it in about five hours, and the skinniest part, you can make it in 20 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes, maybe 15 if you drive really quick, yeah. and about an hour and a half, two hours in the thickest part in the west side, and there's about four large mountain mastiffs, so there's a lot of different variation on the island, and that's what makes Crete so fun, yeah. and so on the east side... It's extremely arid and it's dry relatively compared to all the others. It's less mountainous yeah. and it's less forested. So we have excellent food preservation, which is really cool. So on this two sites I work at, Maklos Excavations, which has been, oh my goodness, uh, Kostis Tavares and Jeffrey Souls have been the directors there for well over 30, 40 years. And I'm very fortunate to be working with a large team there. I study the ceramic material. Mm. And we have great floral and fauna evidence for cooking and for uh, building fires, for building houses, for all sorts of things, which is really fun. Exciting. And yeah, it's really cool. And then another site called Popa de Ocampos, the lead excavator is Krisa Sofianu. She's also the uh, and head of the Greek Archaeological Service here in Lasithi. And she partners with one of my dear friends and mentors, Tom Brogan. And um, I also am working on the ceramics there. 
And we also are incredibly lucky to have tons of like food remains there. So it's really funny to study. It's really fun and funny, I guess, to study <laughs> both of those kitchens from, from both of those sites. So it's very cool. It's very nice. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So for, uh, obviously for the general audience, um, when we're talking about, uh, um, Minoan and Crete and, um, and um, the civilization of, of that period, um, because people don't know enough, I guess. <laughs> uh, how long yeah. ago was that? So what do we say about Minoan? Minoan yeah, so Minoan culture, I mean, chronology is never my strong suit. So you'll, you'll have to like, we'll have to kind of go through this together. But the beginning of the Minoan period is quite, I think it's about 5,000 years. And, and it's 3,000 BC is when it starts. And that before that was the Neolithic period on Crete, let's say, yeah. and in the Aegean. And that particular time period, the Neolithic period, um, we have a lot of evidence, but it's um, mainly kind of stuck and tucked underneath a lot of the large Minoan sites here on mm. the island. So a lot of it we can't access, unfortunately, like we can in northern Greece. But um, we do have evidence of them farming and um, really kind of being the first settlers. But as far as the Minoans, we really look at them, and I believe most of the archaeologists would agree that the Minoans are kind of thought of to be Europe's first state civilization. Mm -hmm. And that means in the sense of having a large administrative center um, in Europe that was trading both locally across the island with other uh, city centers or palaces, as well as around the Greek mainland, uh, Greek islands, and then, of course, abroad, um, which would be present day, like Turkey, the Near East, yeah. Africa, things like yeah, that. Egypt. So, Egypt, yeah, Egypt. Egypt, yeah. And Egypt, yeah, exactly, absolutely. So it was, it was a very um, important uh, society. The time period, it would have started around 3000 BC, and those people would have been and looked much different than at the end, which was for around 1450 BC. Mm. These dates are all very flexible. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so if any experts listening, please be kind. <laughs> um, <laughs> right? But, um, but at the end um, is the time period that I focus on. I focus on the late Minoan period, where it's basically the second palace period. Mm -hmm. Um, where we have the second large administrative centers that have kind of um, been rebuilt. We have large uh, villas, harbor towns. It looks to be like a really kind of a certain type of dist wealth distribution yeah. across Crete and a lot of international trade. Um, it was also during the time of the Theron eruption on Santorini, which was a time that was initially thought to have destroyed the Minoan civilization. It was a huge mm. eruption, volcanic eruption, that people also like to think um, and link it to the to the lost city of Atlantis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not <laughs> <But> cool. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's very romantic mm. to think about that. But unfortunately, uh, Moklos, the site that uh, Jeff and Costa uh, excavate, they have found buildings, which is quite exciting, um, both in the harbor town and on the artisan quarters. They found Theron ash, and there's Theron ash underneath newly built buildings and restored buildings. So we have a lot of evidence in East Crete suggesting that after the Theron eruption, they were definitely rebuilding and everything continued to go. Yeah. I'm sure it was still chaotic, and I just really, it's hard for me to imagine what life would have been like, but we do know that things continued on. Um, so it was a time of great wealth. It was also a period where there was a lot of contact with the really big, you know, kingdoms in the Near East and the Far East, where we think that the Minoans initially had a lot of contact and possibly had um I don't know. There's a lot of debate where the Minoans came from. Mm. And, and you can understand if you look on the map of where Crete is located, you know, it's quite possible that the Minoans came from many different places exactly. yeah. initially. And then, um, you know, as Neolithic people, and then maybe later kind of came together to form the Minoan civilization. Mm. I mean, th there's a thousand theories out there and we don't need to get into that because we're talking about food. 
but um, yeah. that's really not yeah. my my strong point. <laughs> but <laughs> that's for that's for a nice glass of wine and you yeah. know just to think about. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think the the project that I like about cooking, I, just to bring it back yeah. a little bit, and doing hands on experience is the fact that you can take these ideas and these these hypotheses that we have or these kinds of things that we like to talk about in history and archaeology and make them real. And so I like that kind of sensory based knowledge, Mm -hmm. you know, and so for me, it's really important to do that, you know, to kind of bring it home a little bit. Um, Fantastic. So, Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, that's about, that's the, that's the Minoans. I will, I do want to point out one thing, not to interrupt you, Mm -hmm. but the Minoans also are considered a prehistoric culture. Yeah. Maybe most people don't know that, but um, they had different types of script. They had a Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A, um, but they're not. They weren't necessarily writing books, and um, there's not a lot of things that we can decipher very clearly yeah. about their culture. So we call it and classify it as prehistoric. Yeah. So the, yeah, so. this uh, this. Uh scripts this writing uh we haven't uh, been able to decipher it so we don't know much about that early period i guess of uh minoan cretans uh but Correct. we do yeah. have do we have linear b from crete we do yeah. there's some linear b on crete mm. it's it tends to be from what i understand um a little bit more like inventory lists there might be some writings but nothing like they have at the great palaces at Pylos mm. and on the mainland yeah. where you really have the center of the Mycenaean culture mm. there. Um, so that leads back to the cooking again in the sense that we don't have Minoan recipes written down. Yeah. You know, we don't really know if they like sweet or sour or salty foods or what time of day they were cooking or what their eating habits were or anything like that. So as archaeologists, we all look at indirect evidence to understand this. Yeah, so it makes your life a little bit more difficult, I suppose. But also it's all the evidence that you find on the field by excavating and analyzing remains, right? Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why you really need to work well with your teammates and, and work on really, you know, big teams. Mm. You know, it's not a one-person job by any means. There's no... There's no way you can one person can unravel all of yes, this. Yes, you know? yes, exactly. It's huge teams. Yeah. Takes long time analyzing and you know. Also, I guess you do a lot of experimental, practical stuff as well, right? That's what I I do. That yeah. yes, I, absolutely, and I believe in that. Yeah. I, I think it's there's of course there's always uh, good ways and better ways. Let's say to do experiments, and I think one must be cautious, but I do think it's. There's always value in doing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the first, the, the first important question would be, what, uh, <laughs> what do Minots ate? What was uh, the food? <laughs> what was the food? Yeah. yeah, I know this is such a fun question. Um, it's really nice because there has been like the golden age of Bronze Age archaeology in the Aegean, in the sense that. Oh, gosh, there's been a lot, a lot of publication um, in the past, let's say, 30, 40 years Mm -hmm. of just heavy duty um, archaeological site and material available for people. Um, And what one of the things that we kind of do is we make these long lists of food kind of compiled from various sites and various sources and ways. So let me tell you the ways that we do that so you can understand a little bit. we look at uh, uh, dried seeds and bones that we find in the archaeological record. We look at some of the scripts, you know, yeah. that we find. Um, we look at iconography, although that's still interpretive because you're not sure if they just painted it or if they were eating it or farming it or whatever. Mm. And um, you know, and then let's see, in chemical residue analysis can sh- can tell you a little bit. And so from all of these things, we kind of find this. Let's say I, I would refer to it as like the Minoan grocery store list. I don't know if that's very appropriate, but anyway, it's fun to think about. You know, if you can take things from the past and kind of put them in context of today, it makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. And so, let's see. Let's start with um, let's start with plants because they're the most difficult to identify. Unless you have really hard woody seeds, it's uh-huh. difficult to to know. So, but we find plums, we find uh, pomegranates. We find um, 
let's say almonds. We find, uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, grapes, you know. And, and what's funny with the grapes, I, I work with one particular woman who's a, a, a seed specialist, Evie Margaritis. And, you know, she can look at the grape seed. And they're so small, but under the microscope, she could tell you, like, if it's been crushed for wine mm. or, you know, if it was left whole so it could have been used as a fruit or a raisin. Yeah. So you kind of like if you take the grape and you're like, okay, you can make wine, you can make vinegar, you can eat it as a raisin, as a fruit, you can, um, you know, do all these different things just with the grape. And I think that's the thing when you start thinking about the food lists, what you can do with each ingredient, it kind of also makes your imagination go a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so we also have olives. Of course, that's a big one. Everyone loves to eat olives, even back in the Bronze Age. Uh, so let's say I, there's a lot of other ones, but I can't have as far as fruits and nuts and things like that. But those are basically the, the primary the, ones yeah. that you find a lot of, yeah. um, you also, for meat, you have a lot of sheep and goat and surprisingly, you find a lot of pork. There's a lot of pork on the Island that was brought during the Neolithic right, and okay. you have a variety of fish. You have a lot of small fish like sea brims. Or like the little, um, what are they called, parrot fish. Right. Things like, you know, little fish like that. But then you also have petalidas. You have sne sea snails, crabs. And we find a lot of those, a lot, a lot of those in the archaeological record. Um, we also have evidence for people trapping. So you'll find wild hare. Um, in the later, later periods, you'll find sometimes deer in, in uh, some of the, in very small, specific areas not across the island right how interesting and yeah. um yeah so the the nice thing about the food basket is it really looks like they were you know farming and hunting and fishing and trapping and doing and foraging you know like mm. doing all the things that you would do today or that you would do a hundred years ago on crete yeah and so like that's pretty exciting when you put it back into context of people um and in terms of um of cooking all that stuff do we do you find evidence on, on how they cooked it or you have to actually try and reconstruct it yourself and um, and experiment basically and see how that would happen? <laughs> um. Yeah, well, it's that is challenging. Um, what, what we do or what I do is I look at the indirect evidence by looking at the size and the shape of the different ceramic utensils that we find. Okay. And that we know we find in these cooking areas and, and how we identify cooking areas because they didn't have built kitchens. For the most part, they would have areas of like uh, burnt soil and uh, charcoal or wood, something like that, mm -hmm. mixed in with food remains and like broken pots, like broken ceramic cooking pots. And you can have these in like corners of a room. Sometimes you would have two or one in a room, depending on how large the room was. And you can have them outside the house yeah. as well. So, and, and even upstairs and um, on, on the upper, floor, uh, upper stories in some of the houses. So they seem to be very kind of like movable in their kitchen or in their cooking places, um, which, is very, which is very funny to me. So you have to kind of look at all of this evidence and think about, okay, what were they doing? So we know they have these very specific ceramic cooking pots. Uh, one was a big belly tripod, which is very good for stewing and simmering, um, boiling, basically. Mm -hmm. um, you can fry in it, but it's very difficult in the sense that it takes a lot of lard or, or oil, but um, oil would have been probably pretty precious back then, so maybe they would have fried in lard instead. Yeah. Um, because they would have had a lot of sheep and goat and pork, you know. Yeah, so. And um, but there's a lot of water that kind of there's a lot of condensation that's built up after a certain temperature level, and I think the water falling back into the oil is a little bit problematic. Um, so it doesn't really it just doesn't fry as well. Yeah. So if, I think if they were to do a saute, they have these you know or like a light frying or you know whatever. They have these big kind of like turtle-shaped dishes. We call them cooking dishes. Some other people call them cooking pans. Yeah. It depends on what tradition you come from. But those are very fun dishes in the sense that you can cook on the inside of the bowl, kind of like a wok. Yeah. 
You can turn them upside down and bake on the back side of them, or you can double stack them and create a Dutch oven. <laughs> Um, so, and I've done all of them and they're, and they all work beautifully for very different types of foods. I mean, really different types of foods. And, and so like, that's, that's pretty cool. How did you, um, how did you end up experimenting on this way? It's like a double stacking them or turning them upside down. Oh, you just think, you think, yeah, you just think about it, you know, you found evidence that, uh, uh, could have been used in these ways as well, uh, or, um, or it's, well, I think. I think you have to always think outside the yeah. box as well yeah. when you're doing this. Like we own, you have to really remember like archaeology material for the most part is trash mm -hmm. and some of it's really beautiful trash and some of it's not beautiful trash. And I typically deal with not so beautiful yeah. trash. And, um, <laughs> and we only have, you know, we only recover a very small part of it, like a fraction of, of a fraction of a fraction of what they would have had. Yeah. And so I'm already, I'm already s severely handicapped in the process. You know, I don't have wooden spoons. I don't have wooden spatulas. If they even had yeah. that, um, I know for a fact they had lids on the cooking pots because you can't get the pot to boil uh, to the correct temperature to make brown lentils unless you do, yeah. or to cook meat properly unless you do. Um, and but you rarely find a cooking pot with a lid, so you have to really kind of you you're forced automatically to go ahead and like think about what 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 within these certain parameters that you're going to set yeah. can work oh, yeah. fantastic uh, yeah but let me tell you one more yeah, let me yeah, tell you sorry sorry it. i know we have two more we have two more ceramic utensils i, I can't leave them out no. because they're so cool no <laughs> one is a circular tray it's a shallow circular tray and you can also double stack those which are really fun and kind of bake on those or bake in them. And you could have maybe also dried like tea or herbs or meat or something like mm. that or, you know, whatever. And they had ceramic grills in the far eastern side of the island. And those you can grill fish on, you can grill meat on, you can do all sorts of stuff on those. Fantastic. Yeah, it's really cool. So you have, you have simmering, boiling, sautéing, grilling, and baking that you can do with just those three or four different types of ceramic utensils. Great, great. Yeah. Um, and in terms of um, remains, of animal remains and so on, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, I suppose it's difficult to find smaller stuff, uh, but it's, it's easier to find big chunks of, uh, of bones if, if it's a goat or a pig. Yeah, the the floor the final evidence guys like the bone guys they can they could probably speak for this better than mm. I can. But I have you know I've sifted through some material before um, that we've washed, and and it's pretty interesting. You can find if you're very careful, and somebody has taught you what to look for, you can actually find something as small as the interior of fish bone oh, wow. of, of, yeah. of fish ears. So you can find like fish, like fish eardrums. You can oh find like, you can find all sorts of like crazy things you thought you could never identify if you have a really good teacher. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then somebody can identify that. It's like the most bizarre specialty in the world. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but, but trust me, there's somebody out there in this world that could do that. <laughs> so, so my guess is that there's somebody that could do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what what do we what do we know about the cooking about the, the mineral cooking and the, the the food and recipes? I mean, were they adventures in in a sense? They cooked a lot of different stuff together, or they were big on a sack barbecue style, you know, on the embers, food, big cuts. Mm -hmm. Or what was what was the thing that you can deduct? Well, I mean, that, it's. <laughs> There's two things that are quite cool. I'll, I'll give you two examples, and then you can tell me what you mm. think. What one is okay? One is well, I'll give you three. One is like the standard: you put the food, you know, you put your brown lentils or you put your meat in the big belly tripod cooking pots, and you just make a stew, yeah. and you know, don't worry about it. Okay, that's fine. I think probably a lot of that went on because um, you do find like halos of these lentils in, um, in the ceramic cooking pots, which is quite cool. Not all the yeah. time, but you can find them. I mean, it, do it does exist. I've seen them, you know. Um, 
but and there and then you you have these amazing sites like Santorini, which is very much like Pompeii mm-hmm. in the sense that so many things are preserved, like even the insects are preserved, which is just unbelievable. And uh, and that particular site, they had this great I forgot what house it was in. They, oh God, I'm not even going to say it because it's it's going to be wrong. <laughs> um, but I know I don't want to embarrass you know myself. But they <laughs> but they had this like great an installation of these ovens where they were baking. Um, tuna and it really looked like they had these u-shaped ceramic plates with like a lip on them and they were like raved raised above on this kind of like u-shape uh, ceramic hearth which was about a meter meter and a half high we made one this is why i know this and it was so cool wow. it was like the 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 best thing in the world to cook on and then they would they found like these tuna vertebrae and there was multiple uh cooking installations like this and so it looked like you know at the time uh this the this building's collapse anyway somebody was making these tuna steaks like this or these tuna these chunks of tuna like that and you know perhaps it was you know for for consumption, for to sell, mm. you know, not necessarily for, it was more than just home consumption. Um, let's put it that way. And so like that, I think that's pretty cool and pretty ingenious. Um, but this is, this is a, this is the, the craziest, if you want to call it a recipe and the artists and quarters in one of the buildings in a kitchen at Moklas in East Crete, we find a tripod cooking pot there is two uh, bones of a rabbit, ha- of, t- of uh, two rab- two full uh, wild hairs. There's bones of a lizard or a snake. Sometimes it's hard yeah. to tell. And then I think uh, uh, eggshells, but of course they can't tell. I don't think they can tell what eggshells they are, what type of eggs. And I just think that's like the weirdest, like surely all of those things were not cooked together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You haven't tried. So what do you think? <laughs> what do you think? Do you think that's a do you think that's a, a bona fide certified Minoan recipe? <laughs> what do you think, Tomas? <laughs> I think uh, I think we can say that it is <laughs> a special unique uh, recipe from uh, Minoan times. Yes. Yes, yeah, something was yeah. going on there. It's yeah. like um, <laughs> patina with eggs and um, uh, lizard and the uh, hair. <laughs> I think so like Yeah, right? And like then a like, meat omelet. Yeah. Uh, Exactly. And how lazy was the cook to not even take the egg out of the shell? That's why it's just like, my God, what's going on? Who was this person? So it must be, it must yeah. be really difficult to try and uh, decipher and untangle all these little things. It's, okay, what's going on here? Yeah. 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 <laughs> but I, but I, you know, I really think for the most part, I mean, we have it another site, which is, re- this is also really bizarre. At this one house we have in Popa de Ocambos, um, Crisa and Tom, they excavated... I think it was four different four different cooking hearths. Each one, and one had a tripod cooking pot. The other had a cooking jar, and the other had a cooking dish. Okay, there was yeah. three, let's say. And in all of them, they had petalitas and um, and uh, sea snails. It was like the seafoods with a fish vertebrae or something yeah. like that. So it was like they all had like a seafood soup and like the same seafood soup going at the same time. It's, it's yeah. It's just so weird. Also remarkable that you can find all this stuff. I know, the, right? Yeah. From three, from what three five thousand yeah, years yeah, ago? Yeah, it just blows my mind every time. I mean, it's just it, it, yeah. It it is actually pretty. It is pretty like you know. It is pretty cool. Fantastic. In terms of um, your um, experimental cooking techniques with uh, with this Minoan cooking, um, what have you done? What's uh, what dishes have you tried to recreate? Let's say. Yeah, so what so what I do with the cooking, I, I really like to, because the whole concept is about exploring and teaching and kind of, you know, taking something that we all do. We all, you know, humans are the only animal that mm. cooks and prepares food with fire. And so we're all, we all do it. We all know about it. It's something that is in our DNA, let's say, or at least in our memory DNA. Yeah. And I think that... Um, that for us, it's a good tool. And so what I like to do is, because we don't have written recipes, we don't really know if the Minoans ate uh, sweet, sour, savory food, whatever. Mm. Um, you know, if their food was fermented uh, before they ate it, 
you know, I mean, there's a lot of things we don't know about the taste. But um, what I like to do is I like to make conceptual dishes that do, that talk about one aspect. So the recipe that I sent you about the brown yeah. lentils with the cracked coriander and honey, that recipe is to 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 demonstrate that um, you know foods travel, right? And that that particular concept is that you know foods are traveling and foods are traded just like other c- precious commodities. Like metal at the time was traded and traveled, um, other kind of raw materials, stones, things like that, uh, die. So you know the idea that like the brown lentils were brought from the Near East during the Neolithic period to the island. The coriander seeds were also a spice from the Near East that was brought to the island. And then um, today, of course, in Greece, we cook our lentils with tomato, and so it kind of has a little bit of a sweet taste. Mm. And because of that, uh, I decided to add a little bit of honey because um, it's also about the landscape of Crete. And, um, and so, like, the honey goes in. I put a little bit of olive oil at the end and then, you know, top it off with sea salt. Yeah. And it's a really nice kind of fragrant, um, aromatic taste about uh, ingredients that we're all very familiar with. But we eat and enjoy in a completely different way. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah. it's a really tasty dish, and you kind of you don't you don't feel the um, the sweetness per se. But it's not sweet. It's not too overly sweet. The dish. It's it's nice no, and I, um, fragrant. Fragrant, let's say, with the coriander and the honey. Because uh, I've tried it I've yeah. done a couple of days ago. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Good. I thought I'll do it before <laughs> before we have a, a discussion. <laughs> uh, yeah. Nice. Uh, and I do think um, anything that would give the food a bit of um, of um, an extra depth and um, certain uh, you know different flavor, would, they would add it. So I think coriander seeds definitely definitely adds uh, something to the lentil dish. Yeah, like the spices that I'm aware of. And that I think most people would agree. They, I think they had, uh, well, I, I know that they had the, the coriander. They had the coriander seeds. They had the, uh, the cumin or the cumin, cumino yeah. uh, seeds. And uh, some, some of the places had fenugreek, or at least it's identified as fenugreek. Mm. I don't know if that was later. Um, and then it just kind of happened to be in the earlier... Uh, material or not but that would have come from afar as well um, and these are all medicinal plants too so you know if if people were cooking with these uh, and also like fennel things like that wild fennel finicia. so I think like these kinds of plants um, they can be used for spices they can be used they have medicinal properties and they also have like aromatic properties for perfume yeah. so I think if you look at the perfume and the and the oil production, uh, aromatic oil production that they had in the Bronze Age, maybe there was some interchange. I I don't really mm. know. I mean, I mean, it's hard to it, say. It is hard to say indeed. Uh, we definitely have some written evidence from linear from linear B that they used cumin or fenugreek and so on, as you said. So I think, um, judging by similar cultures, Mesopotamia and you know. Ancient Egypt mm-hmm. and so on. Exactly. We can, we can kind of detect that you know food was medicinal also, and medicine was food at the same time. So yeah, th- the whole thing was interchangeable. So I guess, yeah, they would have used it in food as part of a medicine or or something to break a spell or whatever, or heal certain, <laughs> or keep some spirits out or whatever. So <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It's um. It's challenging, let's say, to 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 put it in like really specific context, isn't yeah. it? But it but it's fun and it and it's nice to think about, particularly when you um, when you compare it to like other cultures and like other practices that are going on. That for sure, if they're doing other sorts of trade and other materials are coming around, people would have had some sort of contact. Yeah. Um, maybe not like an in depth knowledge, but there would have been something. Not everybody was isolated. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, something that I, I discover more and more by, by looking for ancient food. And and yeah. that people were as interconnected uh, as uh, we are now. 
Um, yeah. I, I would like to point out one thing, and I do uh, just – just it's a question for you, actually. Um, you know, the the use of linear A versus linear B when talking about Minoan food, I do find a little bit difficult in the sense that linear B is really associated with the Mycenaean and with, like, the late, late Minoan period, if you want to call it the transition yeah. period between Minoan and Mycenaean. And while that is on Crete, that is a little bit different – uh, culturally mm. than the pure Minoan, um, even though they did have a lot of contact with the Mycenaean world. And so, you know, it is quite, it is quite funny um, to think about and to, and to kind of, kind of make those kind of cultural distinctions and those kind of lines, like where, where that's going to be drawn. Yeah, as more and more research comes out um, with the uh, with the botanical remains, and I'm sure people are, are are doing this. I mean, I know some papers are out. Um, it would be, you know, there people will say, okay, like, you know, like the villas or this particular site, you know, is like having or this particular time period has this kind of like food mm. or this kind of uh, let's say resources, and while this one. Um, and this particular like structure, this particular time period have these kinds. Um, so, you, so there is a little bit of comparison and contrast that might be able to be made as more and more evidence is found yeah. and studied and published, which is really quite interesting. You can get signatures, you know, food signatures that way. But I think the evidence is quite scanty to make really broad, big, large statements at this point. You yeah, know, yeah. That would you know, that would be, that could get a lot of people retracting a lot of things later yes, on, yes, exactly. <laughs> which is okay. I don't have a problem with that, but mm. you know, it happens. Fantastic. And, um, yeah, talk us a little bit about, uh, can you talk a bit, a bit about your project, your Minoan taste, uh, project? What do you do? And, um, uh, how long it's been going on and, uh, some of your recipes perhaps, uh, yeah, what sure. What do you do, and uh, how? What was the impression of people? How do they find it, and all that stuff? Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it's, those are a lot of questions. Um, let's see, how does it work? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that we do, and one of the things that like the Minoan Taste Project really uh, specializes in, is creating the experience of of hearth cooking, and um, and it and taking the idea of Let's, if you want to put it in a way that's a little bit um, more nurturing in the sense that it, it really slows down the pace of the cooking and the eating time, let's say, of your day. Because um, when you come to us, you're going to spend like two to four hours uh, just eating, cooking, preparing, and sitting in front of a fire, mm. um, just either talking or making pottery or painting or just doing nothing, you know, it doesn't matter. But, you you know, you're there for this, you know, specific period because it takes a long time to cook in a ceramic pot. Like, we are really used in our modern day life to think about you chop up stuff, you put it in a blender, you put it in a chopper, you, you know, put it in the microwave, you put it in the oven, you put it in the pressure cooker, like whatever you do. And within 30 minutes, 15 minutes, yeah. it's done. And then you sit down and you eat and yeah. then you go <laughs> and you do the next thing. And you're like, yeah, that's great. Then that's really awesome, you know, but it's not always like that. Of and course. so the idea of kind of slowing the pace down is really important for us and kind of allowing to give space for other things mm. to happen. And a lot of that is about conversations about cooking, conversations about uh, the past, conversations about the future. Um, and so when you come to us, there's often a big cooking hearth, uh, or a small one and the fire's made and the food is already half prepared and, and being cooked because it takes about four to six hours for some of these dishes yeah. to be made. And so, you know, we really try to create an experience like that for people, um, to come and cook and enjoy with us. What we do is, um, we do private dinners, private lunches. We also do, uh, workshops for groups of like you know 10 to 100 people oh, wow. <laughs> we we also do a lot of like um let's say uh, educational work for the public school system here in in crete 
And so we'll work with local silicas, silicas sometimes to put on festivals or to help them raise money for something they want to do that's important for them. So while it's a formal business, let's say in Greece, we also do an awful lot of community work um, where we where we can yeah. fit in and where it's appropriate. Um, so we do like we wear many different hats, and but the whole idea is to promote culinary culture, to promote good diet, to promote like a holistic yeah. lifestyle, um, but to also like help uh, preserve the ancient history of Crete of Greece, of the Aegean, and to promote it and to promote like preservation of all these things Mm, as well. Yeah. So, um, the dishes that we cook though, I mean, we do everything. We do seafood, we do land animals, we do vegetarian, um, we do vegan, although it's quite hard (laughs) because everybody really like it. And honestly, the cheese here is so amazing that you like have to have it. Like how, how can you deny yourself, you know, Greek cheese? I don't know why you would do that. Yeah. It's just, you have to have it, but it's fun. You know, we think about like, um, we, we don't have a lot of evidence for birds. And so the idea of like chicken, I always have this discussion with people with chicken. It's so funny because I do serve a lot of chicken because people, People are like, well, can I have some chicken? I'm like, yeah, okay, fine, have some chicken. Because we, <laughs> which is so controversy. You can't imagine like the amount of discussion of chicken bones I have with people. Oh, yeah. But there are some archaeological sites with chicken bones in them. But they're like, no, no way, no way. You know, the specialists are like, those are much later. I'm like, fine, you know, we'll tell these guys that publish it. But, you know, I don't care. I, you know, I really yeah. don't mind. Because if people are coming to me and they don't want to eat meat and they don't want to eat, and when I mean meat, like I mean like goat or sheep or like pork, I mean, but like birds. It's difficult you know. though, isn't it? I um, mean, you want to, people to yeah. immerse themselves into that period of time. And, you know, <laughs> you cannot be choosy. Just, you know, try and experiment. I know. Well, and, yeah. you know, for me, I love to eat snails. I love to eat rabbit. I love to eat mm. hare. I love to eat, like, I love to eat all of them, you know? And, like, everyone's like, or, you know, rooster. And everyone's like, oh, come on. It's just like, please don't make us do that. Um, <laughs> no way. So, I, I'd love to so eat that stuff. Yeah, so yeah. they're quite funny. Yeah, they're like, can we have some meatballs? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but we do, we, we do do everything. And so... <laughs> Except for meatballs. We don't do meatballs. Um, but like, for example, we, we do do chicken. Um, but So we try to modify it as best as we can. Um, I mean, we, we, we do cook at one of the local tavernas. There's a local fish taverna that we partner yeah. with. And it's so funny because inevitably we'll have kids come and they're like, can we have potatoes? I'm like, sure, it's fine. Um, so we'll do so – what, so when we have situations like that, we're like, okay – Guys, we're gonna we're gonna have a lesson between what is ancient food here on Crete and and, and what is modern mm. food and why that is and, and they get into it though, and and so that's cool. So I think I think there's always opportunities, particularly when it comes to eating. My God, if you can't take opportunities with eating to talk about yes. history and talk about the future, what in the world are you gonna t- be able yes, to talk about? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, but some, I will tell you one of our dishes that I really love, but it's a, it's a, it's a Mm. heavy dish in the sense that it's very rich. It's a lamb, it's a lamb dish and it's really about the Cretan landscape. Um, we have a dish here called Sinohandro and it's a cracked wheat that they collect in August and they boil it in a sour milk. I'm I'm sure you're very familiar with it. They boil in a sour milk and then they sun dry it the cracked wheat uh, on the roof and or in the oven now and um and then they rehydrate it throughout the year and so i take the sinohandro and i take the lamb we cook those together and we use a, a wild sage a Cre- it has to be a cretan sage it can't be a different kind. right okay. and um, now. that is it's really really delicious because and you don't eat very much of it because it's like it's extremely mm. heavy but um, but when you taste it and the smells and the taste of all of that, it's really like the Cretan landscape in the sense that you have that that nice kind of well-rounded like uh, sheep and goats uh, kind of flavor mixed with like the grain, the texture of the grain, and then like the aroma of like that wild Cretan sage. And um, those are the things that through food you can really kind of transport you to a place, you know, through the Fantastic. senses. Oh, yeah, that sounds really yeah, good. Yeah, it's nice. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you hungry? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like to cook? What do, What is your favorite meals to cook? Um, I I love uh, cooking on uh, charcoal and barbecue and embers. So I, yeah. I love doing stuff uh, on the barbecue. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I would do. Uh, I'm sure they did that. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. But I'm sure they did that as well. It's just we don't find a lot of evidence. There's some things that we don't find in the archaeological record, and that would be a very good example of what we would mm. not find. Yeah, I mean, there's this conception of people thinking that, okay, fire is the the oldest way of cooking, so people must have cooked <laughs> uh, on the barbecue since uh, the beginning of time. But probably it's not true, is it? So it's also dependent on what you have available in the season and yeah if if we have clay pots or uh, or pottery then people would cook stews and uh, things that they found uh, call it, yeah. yeah in the americas they in the americas they would have these this crazy thing what would they do they would make this like hole in the earth uh. and they would they would like Gosh, how did it work? I can't remember exactly how it worked. But basically, they would heat it. It, it just seems so crazy to me. I've never done it. If you decide to do it, give yeah. me a call. I'll, I'll come watch. <laughs> like, they would basically dig a hole. And I think they would line it with clay or mud or something. And then they would fill in the liquid. It, it had to have been liquid-based. Right. Because what they would do is they would take this special kind of rock. And it was, a, it was round. And they would heat it up. And they would make it like just... It was called fire. We call it fire cracked Mm -hmm. rock. And you would heat it up as hot as it could get. And then you, excuse me, and then you would roll it into this like uh, hole with food in it. And you would roll, and those hot stones would cook the food. I just think that's the weirdest. I mean, it's. it's... (laughs) I don't don't know why. I just think it's so bizarre. It's just. It's just so thought, weird to me to think that that, yeah, that yeah, works. It works, and you know, it's yeah. yeah. How in the world? If yeah, if you can make fire hot enough to to warm up stones, why in the heck would you just not barbecue your? I don't get it, but whatever. I mean, that's what they were doing, and so like that was that was one thing that was bizarre. And then people would also cook in like you know leather bags or or the stomach yes. of the animals, you know, yeah, all yeah. sorts of things. I think that that's a lot of. Experimental stuff that I haven't done yet, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, for um, for um, from what I read, from what I read, and I try and recreate uh, ancient dishes, I'm I'm always trying to marry the the sweet element, you know, sweet and sour and herbs, lots of herbs and spices, I'm trying to marry this and try and figure out some some dishes okay. that they could have been eaten in ancient uh, Symposia. <laughs> Uh huh. Nice. Mm-hmm. So, if you could time travel, would you time travel back to one of these dinners? Uh, I have to. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's no question. <laughs> there's no question about it. You're like, I'm yeah. done. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, if, I, if I could travel back in time once, you know, that you had you had only one chance to travel back in time, then then probably it would have been in Syracuse in uh, modern Sicily. <laughs> Well, in ancient, yeah. Oh, in nice. Because okay. I think they were the most extravagant uh, uh, of all the ancient Greek citizens. I think they were very wealthy and they were in the middle of the mm-hmm. Mediterranean traveling all across uh, the ancient known world. Uh, so, yeah, they were wealthy, well-traveled traders and, yeah, they were always uh, big for their uh, extravagant <laughs> dinners and there were, it was a richer culture uh, uh, ri- than the mainland uh, Greeks uh, and richer mm-hmm. they had richer um, well more food basically they had uh, mainland Greece is more mountainous and more wild and so it's more difficult yeah. to grow an abundance of different produce so I think the, the, the Syracuse and Greeks they <laughs> they were more spoiled I think <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think <laughs> you, one of their diners. They would have better yes, parties. Yes, better parties, yeah, better <laughs> wine, <laughs> more food. So I think, uh, yeah, I think it would be one of my <laughs> dinners. Yes. So that's really good. <laughs> that's great. I love it. Yeah, yeah I think I think that's, that's me, yes. Uh, what about you? <laughs> I don't know. I'm a little bit afraid to time travel. <laughs> But if I could time travel, gosh, I you know I don't know I don't know what I would do. 
I think I think somebody would just have to give me a ticket and be like, "This is where you're going." I'd be like, "All right, that's cool," <laughs> but I, but I definitely want to go someplace in the Mediterranean and like not any place that's like horrible. Yeah, I, you know, I agree. You know, but not any place too decadent. Mm, okay. <laughs> because yeah, I know because all these other questions come. Like, would you be an observer or a participant? You know, would you go as yourself or somebody else? You know, those are those are the, because look, you're a man, and so you get to you would you would have many more doors open for you in the True. ancient you're, world than I would as right. a woman. Yeah, so I have to be a little more careful yes. <laughs> than you. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make sure I'm going to really make sure I'm going to go into the yeah, right yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, maybe me know on. Um, Crete was a better place for women. I mean, allegedly. Yeah. Yes, but allegedly, yeah. but who knows? I mean, it's all these knows? things that we I as mean, a, assume, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it is cool. I mean, it is something I would really like to see, like particularly if you could like fly over, mm. you know, like in some sort of like quiet, invisible yeah. jetpack. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Do you do you make your own pots or I do. I make a lot of them, but I also work with other potters. Um, sometimes they'll make the really large ones and then I'll put mm. the legs on or the ears on, make the lids with them. I mean I participate in all of the pot making. Um, but I do have yeah, help do, sometimes. Do, so this pots um, I mean I suppose we might think of ancient people more primitive, but how complex and how how in, good to cook with are this uh, ancient pottery you they're really great i mean i love them they're they're perfect but they must have uh, obviously they must impart some flavor on the food i suppose or make it i don't know yeah. oh i think so yeah. yeah i think i i definitely believe that and i but i'm a big believer like even if you're cooking in cast iron i think it makes the food taste mm. different if you're cooking in glass it takes you know i think whatever utensils you use i do think it affects affects the taste of the food but with ceramics for sure and mine are not glazed you know they're they're unglazed on the interior so the food over time as you cook them they become more and more seasoned mm -hmm. and but what is what is quite interesting which is really fun and, and you'll see this when you come is that you can smell the interior of a pot before you cook and maybe you'll smell like what you cooked before like particularly if it was octopus right. or like supia milani or something like that that has a heavy mm -hmm. smell but then, like, when, let's say you cook lentils in it the next time. The lentils do not taste like octopus or yeah, yeah, no. There's absolutely no flavor, no taste, no nothing. And and I think that's really quite mm. remarkable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's cool. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, mind, mind blowing, to be honest. Yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Because we, we, we think, it is. I guess nowadays we think it a bit more sterilized, more sanitized, our cooking and more, but more. Um, you know, you have one pot, you wash it afterwards, then uh, to, when you cook something different and so on. And it must have been so different tasting. Yeah, it's a rich taste. I mean, the, the foods that I cook in general, they're heavy, heavily, uh, heavy protein foods, heavy protein based, and they have a really rich taste. So you really don't eat a large mm. portion, like anywhere from 90 to 180 grams, you know, which is about... You know, and you can have like one or two portions, three portions of those of different types of flavors. And, and you're really full. Like you really can't eat anything else. Yeah. Like having a light fruit or a dried fruit yeah. for dessert or maybe one of those amazing like, you know, Egyptian ice creams mm. that you were talking about <laughs> <laughs> on your last yeah. podcast. That would be so awesome if the Minoans um, had that technology from the maybe, Egyptians. Maybe, yes. We'll yeah, have to yeah. look that up. I mean, Hanya <laughs> has lots of big mountains and so... Who knows? Yeah, I know. What if, what if, Jenny Moody, the archaeologist that brought me over, she was always, you know, imagining Minoan ice cream in the in the left hole. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was like, absolutely, sign me up. I'm there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dick excellent, me. excellent. Fantastic. <laughs> right. So. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much for talking uh, to me about. Um, your uh, projects and the ancient Minoan food and what we know of of it. Um, and yeah. yeah, absolutely. It was a lot of fun. It was, Thank it's you. It's great to have some clarity because obviously I wasn't um, aware of um, 
of the cuisine of the time, basically. And it's it's obviously it's a very difficult subject to talk about because we don't have any written evidence. So it's it's all uh, what the archaeologists um, find, and yeah, it's difficult to to bring that to the forefront for all people. So yeah, I think it's a great conversation to have with you, and you know, see see what happened three thousand years ago and how is it connected to today and uh, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I think it's a lot of fun, and I think it's you know one of many conversations in the in the sense that um, like you're right. There's there's so much there's so much to know and and so much interpretation. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you again, and um, have a lovely night. You too, absolutely. And you keep cooking. I'm I'm going to look forward to more of your adventures. Yeah, I, I hope um, you know. Once we go out of this pandemic, I can, because I like cooking for other people too, you know. Uh, I know, right? That's the thing about this situation. It's like, I cook all the time, but like, who are you cooking yes, for? Yes, exactly. So <laughs> when I have an excuse to cook for a lot of people, then uh, I'll do a lot more of this uh, ancient dinners and try and uh, get into the spirit of uh, <laughs> the ancient world. <laughs> So look, here's the deal, Tomas. When you have a, one of your ancient dinners after all of this is over, you send me a, an email and I will fly up to London to one of them. Excellent. excellent. I'm coming. Yes, I'm, yes. I'm coming. <laughs> I'll come as a participant. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. On that note, let's um, wrap I know we got to go. And, uh, yes, Absolutely. Thank you so much for the, uh, You for too. Time. Have a great, great night. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Delicious Legacy podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And uh, remember to share it with your friends and family. Um, Leave us a review on Acast or Spotify or iTunes. It helps a lot. And if you're interested to find out more about ancient food in general and you would like some exclusive recipes and uh, exclusive content, then why not sign up on our Patreon page at the Delicious Legacy Podcast if you go to Patreon. And yeah, for $3 per month, you can have access to some very, very interesting uh, ancient content. Thank you. Goodbye.